All right. Well, we're here with COVID convo number four. My name's Kat, and I'm here with Chris Harrigan. He has an illustrious um, career in film and television going back many years, starting off in the mainstream, doing camera work for news, moving into documentary filmmaking for networks such as CBC, CTV, Discovery Channel, and then later moving into uh, independent filmmaking and becoming an nationally or internationally recognized can we say that that's accurate internationally recognized filmmaker i and guess award, so i've, I've met people from filmmaker. all over who've seen some stuff that i've done so i guess that's okay <laughs> yeah we'll say that and um, we're very lucky that he's actually here in moncton so has been involved in some citizen journalism activities over the last year and a half where we've been going through um, things relating to the covid emergency measures lockdowns and and so on so we'll touch on that a bit but I think the meat of our conversation today, Chris, is we wanted to talk a little bit about propaganda and to help people understand, uh, maybe from a behind the scenes perspective, uh, from your experiences, some of what you feel is most important for people to understand in order to get a better grasp on how media is manipulated, how these ideas are created and communicated in a way that is inherently manipulative and dishonest and what that kind of looks like um, behind the scenes from the newsmakers and creators point of view, getting to the point where we're the viewing audience, the general public, basing our lives around these reports and, and, uh, and our relationships being directly affected. So it's, it's a very, it's a big topic, propaganda, and it bleeds into every area of life. So if that's not too much of a kickoff point for you, what comes to mind if you could take us back to when you were doing sort of your earlier work and just learning about this industry from the inside? What was surprising to you when you were young and I'm sure full of passion and starting to realize how things were actually working? Well, that's a that's a interesting question. Um, I'd have to kind of go back a little bit because uh, like I was a high school dropout. Like I just couldn't get along with it. I, I didn't feel like I was learning. And, you know, so I left high school in grade 10. Um, and then I, later on, I went back and got my, just the credits I needed and I went to university. And I thought that was like the pinnacle, you know, university, oh wow. And nothing that, so this was my wake up point. It's like nothing disappointed me so much as the university. It was just like, what is this? You know, you give me a book, I got to repeat what's in the book. There's no, and I couldn't understand because I love documentaries ever since I was a kid. And I couldn't understand why they weren't showing us visually what was going, you know, because I'm a visual person. And so I, I, after my third year, I was taking philosophy, which I loved. I did love philosophy. I had a great professor that I liked that I followed. And uh, eventually he got us to make a video about freedom. And... I was hooked. I got an A plus and I got him to write me a letter and uh, to, and I went on, to, I, I left and went to uh, television school. Well, my friend was working at the Better Network. He works for the Trailer Park Boys now. Uh, and he was the one that convinced me. Like he was like, Chris, you're missing your calling here. Like this, you know. So it took about a year to convince me or convince myself. And then I left and I went to um, college which was also a huge disappointment, but I mean, I, I did gain all this, the skills, you know what I mean? Like, uh, but I mean, anybody, yeah, you could actually go to Rogers and volunteer and, and get the same amount of education, if not more quicker. Um, but it does give you all the, the ABCs of, of television, three point lighting and all, you know, how to set up a studio and all this stuff. So, um, um, from there, I, I, I was a local, I, I, you know, my first year out, I worked at Rogers. That's, I was a producer, director, cameraman. Like I, 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 I didn't actually work there. I was at, like, a t I was an independent. So I had a whole bunch of different jobs that made up my 40 hours sure. and filled in all the blanks for them because I was able to do it all, right? Uh, editing, camera, directing. I produced my, I produced actually their signature show. Um, and then uh, my, and then I got poached by a company here that was making a Discovery Channel show. And this was, I swear, that was like the last good series on Discovery. It was called Stones of Fate and Fortune. It was all about gemstones. And um, I was an online editor, which has nothing to do with the, 
the internet. It's basically mastering. And I was also an offline editor, which is the, um, the storytelling part, you know, like the, so I, I worked on a few of those shows and then, and that was great. But right next door to us, there was a, there was a, like actually in the same building, they were doing a fr frontiers of construction. Mm -hmm. And that's when it started getting like kind of like biggest, fastest, blah, 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 like more, you know, no substance, like just no substance. You know. um, well, it, was, it was all right, though. And then there was Monster Garage. And then it just, you know, and I have worked for Discovery Channel quite a bit since. Um, and I've been lucky in my career because a lot of the stuff I worked on did have integrity. You know, like we did a... For instance, there was a CBC documentary, um, well, Radio Canada, but we exposed uh, the government for just completely polluting Baldoon with cadmium from the industries and uh, gypsum. Uh, I mean, it, you look over like an aerial view over a bit, bit, a bit of shadow, like a, 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 I don't know what the English word is, bit shadow. It just looks like the, the bottom is just paved white, like it's just completely decimated and ca and so the government was denying that uh cadmium caused cancer however what we discovered was in belgium all those <laughs> studies had already been done and it was conclusive and they shut down all the industries there that produced it and it was all in one area and it's called the sahara of belgium like nothing grows there nothing like no not even microbes like nothing just sand um but when I worked in news, that, okay, so after the, my first Discovery Channel show, we had a government thing. I don't know if they cut the television fund or something, but they're always getting in the way. So my friends uh, were already there from college and they were like, well, come down here. Lots of work. So I did. And I went to work for CTV, ATV, CTV for, um, I don't know, a year or so. Like, And it was like, I don't know, the, some of the older people remember Hurricane Juan. Um, that was the year I worked there. Like, there was a lot of pretty exciting stuff. It was, uh, the elections were going on. And however, that's when I started seeing it because we would, you know, deal with, I dealt with spin doctors on a daily basis. You know, they'd sit there and tell us everything that was actually going on. And, you know, and then the second the camera's rolling, they flip it. Right. And, you know, I saw little dishonest things like, journalists especially like the pretty ones they could get guys to say whatever they wanted <laughs> i just need you to say this <laughs> you know that kind of thing and uh there were some stories that we were uh, i was involved in that uh, you know we find out halfway through the day that it's not it's it's not true and they run it anyway and what people have to understand is these shows are tight like you know like when when i forget his name there what's a Steve uh, I know who you mean Murphy yeah Steve Murphy like you know I, I I've watched been... TV in like 15 years by the way right <laughs> hey same I haven't watched <laughs> since 2009 but when I've you know you it. know <laughs> yeah you just uh, like uh, as soon as Obama did like the the bailouts I was like that's it I'm out like I'm not ever watching this garbage again and plus I can't stand commercials um so, uh, yeah, like all he's doing is reading a teleprompter. That's what these people do. Like, I mean, it was Steve Murphy does have really good interview skills. Don't get me wrong. But that's not like he's just reading what's written. It's right under the camera. That's your teleprompter. You know what I mean? Like, so they're looking right at the camera, but they're reading. And they read in this amount of time. That's their skill. And maybe some of the people out there have seen the Carlisle group when they have like you see the different news uh, stations saying exactly the same thing, exactly. And then it fills out the whole screen and it literally times out to the last word, right? So what we because have ultimately that, is what is um, performing as news or journalism, but what equates to essentially reading a press release. And it's not clear where these these news reports are coming from, but from if I'm understanding what you're saying, there's there's a significant difference between a journalist and a news reader or an, a television personality. But that distinction is not always made for the viewing audience. Exactly. In, in fact, I would say it's 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 We're never made. 
Yeah, it's just not me. Like you, you assume that that person, you know, Steve Murphy or whoever, or uh, Lloyd Robertson. I don't even know if he's still on TV, but you know, they, they have that the look it, to convince you that this has integrity, and and they're so they're they're somewhat actors, is what you know. Like I mean, if you you can look at it that way, but the way it works, I mean, the technicians. I mean, we're I was a cameraman there. I wasn't a journalist. Um, and I've never been a journalist actually until, I, no, I've never, anyway, I, we'll talk about that later. I, I do present news, but I tried never to give a spin. Like, you know, when we had the fight bill 11 and bill 39. We had, I had to, I stepped up to, to counter the, the garbage that global and CTV and all them were saying, all oh, these militant and anti-vaxxers and da, da, da. And really it's just, a, you know, mothers with their kids and, you know, just like, it's like, no, it's, it's ridiculous. That was a great so, example of the media inaccurately reporting real, true, verifiable events, you know, for individuals who were there during Bill 11, you know, it's exactly what you said, mothers, children, peaceful, totally, and, and there was not a sentiment at all of anti-anything. It's really for um, protection and rights and freedoms and, and ultimately protection of children in that case. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a great example of how, and I believe the media also uh, reduced the, the reported numbers of, of people in attendance as well. So they made it seem like there was a lot less people there um, that, that cared about that issue enough to show up then there actually was, which is another way, another very simple technique of just skewing public perception to not give them an accurate um, view of what public perception actually is, which builds public perception in an interesting circle. Well, I, I truly think that had, uh, and, and the people, they got behind me. I mean, like when I'm doing these things, I'm not making money. Like I have to, you know, so people would donate money and, and it was just, and, and it was hard. Like, I mean, I, I was, I knew this had to be beat and um, I had lost my place um, at the end of my lease in July. And, um, and actually I went to Mexico to save money. It was really my only option. It was ridiculous. You know, and I got back and they threw me in quarantine and then this stuff happened and it was a second incarnation. Second incarnation. Bill 39 was the first one. Bill 11 was the second one. So Bill 39, I covered all that also. Uh, you know, and we had Dr. James Lyons Wheeler, Dr. Bob Sears, all these people, and the media would not show up. They would not show up to debate. The government would not show up to debate. They were silencing them. So the fact that I had the skills to go down and make thing uh, 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 products, I guess we'll call it, that resembled what people are used to seeing in the news you know it may be even a little better because i was putting some care and time into it where they're just showing up to do you know viz um that gave us a tool to send to the mlas and 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 get the word out to the people you know and that you know that was able to sway them because i think we wouldn't have i don't think we would have won you know but we won we won both times and it was hard. And the second time I was literally sleeping on my friend's couch. Like, I mean, there's, I was getting this done. I was editing till six in the morning. Like it was, it was a battle and, but we won, you know? And then after that, I just, I had to go back to work. So I did. And um, so, but and when I was working in the news, I'll get back to that because the way it works is like, you know, the technicians and everybody like there were like, there's a main floor that everybody sees on live at five. They're like with the computers and everything. And that's, yeah, and that's where the desk is, like, you know, and, and Peter Code, who was the weather guy back then, I think it's Cindy Day now, I don't even know, but, you know, he's, he's got his desk over there, and it's all just one big room, and, but in the morning, the journalists, they all go up into the, into this glass room, up, up top, and those, you know, I can't tell you exactly what goes on in there, but I, you know, I know that they're giving, they're being told to, this is the angle that we want. This is what, you know, and I know this because, you know, when I was shooting the elections, they are partisan. <laughs> and um, I won't say which side they're leaning towards, but I would go and I would shoot like the candidate or candidates or different people. And they would, all, it would tick me off because I, I, you know, I wasn't wise to this really yet. 
and I'm trying to get the best shot and frame it nice and then and I and they take the worst ugliest shot out of the bunch right yeah. because they're, they're shaping your perception and it's very powerful I mean we've all seen that this year very very powerful you're always marrying information with a feeling that's yeah. television that's the foundation of marketing as well. And what we have now parading as news or journalism is often just a form of marketing and propaganda. It might be helpful if we stop there for just a moment. How would you define the difference between true journalism in the classical sense, not what we see now, but like, you know, back in the day, the idea of the intrepid independent reporter who goes and gets the facts and tells the story versus propaganda and what would you say is the main difference okay i i don't quite understand the question well the difference between journalism and propaganda i guess put more simply um, from the classic sort of view where we used to see journalism as something that was going to be inherently in having integrity and be fair and balanced, right? To borrow uh, Fox News's old, old um, tagline. I don't know if they still use it, Um, but we still think journalism is fair and balanced. Now what we're getting is almost by definition propaganda most of the time. Well, I'd I'd almost argue that all television is somewhat propaganda, you know, uh, to some degree, because you can't, there's always gonna be a certain amount of bias. Right there, somebody is trying is influencing through their view. You know, I could take a story and I could make two. You know, like that's why you'll see a documentary and then you'll see a, a like a, an expose and then you'll see a debunk documentary and, and both are very very convincing, right? Like, right. Yeah. and somewhere in between probably lies the truth. Um, but what we're seeing now, I mean, is just like I was. You know, you got to remember, I was in news twenty years ago, right? So it wasn't nearly as bad as it is now. So as far as like the, the good journalists and stuff, I mean, the only place you're going to find that now is alternative media, right? James Corbett, Dan Dix, and, and they all have a, their spin on it too. You know, like, mm-hmm. I mean, you just can't separate it, but at least, or the high wire, but like James Corbett, Del Big Tree, they give you all the sources, which is very important, you know? So you can discern, you can, you can look and you can go see all the sources are there. Yeah. Unless you're getting that, um, now it's just plain, oh, it's just, it's, it's disgusting. I mean, what we're seeing now is just completely disgusting. Now it's just lies. Like it's just complete lies. And I mean, it's being spun. Like it, uh, there's obviously an, an agenda. There's obviously an agenda because they're lying you know they hide the facts they censor the truth and uh, i mean people always have to remember that the the major funder of all television is the pharmaceutical companies like they make up i think like over 50 percent of the you know and you're not going to bite the hand that feeds you so when these people go up into that glass room you know i'm sure those talking points are coming from toronto like you know what i mean because the whole CTV is nationwide and they all have to kind of be in lockstep to some degree, right? So the local stuff uh, is more true, you know, because you're going out and you're getting a story. Uh, you're doing the interviews, you're getting it, you know, it's, it's not rocket science. But the, the bigger stories or, or, or political or all those kind of things, they're definitely uh, slanted. Uh, did that answer your question? I hope it did. I think so. And just touching on again, maybe just to, to reiterate or summarize, um, journalism in its classic form is inherently supposed to idealistically be balanced or close to objective, at least in an idealistic form. And in terms of reporting, that's what we classically think. And if I'm understanding correctly, what you're saying now is it's much more slanted, even when it's posing to be objective. It is slanted. And there's many, many techniques that are used. You mentioned touching on emotional hot buttons and emotional triggers. Um, That's one thing that is usually accomplished right in the headline. (laughs) You know, a a journalist is always looking for the the soundbite. Like they're going to interview you and, and until they get that soundbite that they want, you know what I mean? Like that, that's a given. Now, when I do reporting, I think like I, 
I really do try to stay um, true to the truth, I guess. So you never see me on camera. Like, I mean, that doesn't happen. Uh, I made a film about Rick Simpson with the cannabis oil and stuff. And it, I, I just try to capture what is happening uh, and show it to you the way it was. You know what I mean? But, you know, of course, I'm looking for the sound bites too and stuff. I mean, it can't really be helped. I mean, it can't be, you can't throw a 15 minute interview up there. Like, uh, nobody's going to listen, right? If it has to be 40 seconds, you got to. And, and the, and the that, makers of media know that most people will engage with that soundbite or that clip or that article or that piece if it is emotionally triggering. And in particular, we know that negative emotions are more um, engaging or compelling than positive ones. So we definitely see a slant or a balance towards the negative, just relentless, um, you know, sadness, tragedy, death, and, and reporting of that versus the more positive and uplifting side of the human spirit and of things that are going on. So there's a huge aspect of emotional manipulation. And we also know when someone is emotionally triggered, this goes for all of us, our logical thinking doesn't, our critical thinking does not function optimally as well. So we're more apt to just accept that information as being true because that logical capacity is kind of taken the back seat. Would you agree with that? Well, yeah, if it bleeds, it leads, you know, like that's, that's the way it goes. And even the most intelligent people um, don't really know how badly they are being manipulated. But I'll tell you this. When you're, watch, when you're watching that person on, in the interview talk, the second that you're, watch, that it's a, you're seeing an image about what they're talking about, guaranteed it's cut. That's why the image is there, hide it, to hide the cut. So you, I tell people all the time, you give me a long enough interview and enough B-roll, which is visuals, I'll get that person to say whatever you want. You know what I mean? Because you can literally just pick words and take words. As long as they're on camera, just long enough that you're convinced that that's actually what they're saying. But they're not. It's a, it's a, it's a guarantee. Guarantee. That's it. And it's just the nature of it. Again, you can't be putting up a half hour interview and have a six hour long show. You know, so if you have an honest director, if you have an honest, you know, then you're going to you're going to get something that's very close to the truth. But somebody can really, really take things out of context. Somebody and I give people the, the example, you know, somebody who could say, I am not for war. And, you know, I decide to take that word not out and throw some viz over there that's going to hit you in the feels. That person just became all about war, didn't they? Yeah. So you're, again, you're talking about that ability of license that media networks or any media content creators, really, even the independent, the little guys, the, the meme warriors, even they, that we have to manipulate a message just by altering it, removing words or putting a different image with um, a particular set of words, which can totally change the emotional tone and the context of it as well. So when we're talking about creating media, that many people are not thinking about how it's being created, they're just absorbing it. The, the field is so open for someone to be creating and implanting a specific idea within that context and using it for their own, for their own gain or ends. Yeah, right. And I mean, at one point, like 